Cinema Classics is brought to you by the Gateway Film Center, 1550 North High Street, Columbus, Ohio. For their details and showtimes online at gatewayfilmcenter.org. The award-winning Cinema Classics is produced by John DeSando and Johnny DiLoretto. Listen to the shoe. Listen to the shoes. <laughs> it's that Sullivan. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Those are the really big shoes. <laughs> Listen to. <laughs> Listen to the shows and read reviews online at WCBE.org. I'm Johnny DiLoretto. I'm John DeSando. This is Cinema Classics. Yes, sir. We're at WCBE in the studios, in Studio A. Yeah, actually. What does that sound like? Actually. Does that sound a little like Alec Baldwin, John? Okay. Does it? You know, a little it bit? does. A but, little bit, but, even? But since we're in Studio B, it would be better <laughs> for you to redo well, that. A, Studio A, B, or C. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter. All right, hey. Without further ado, we are talking about Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, You've boy. got a little picture right here. I uh, Baldwin featured prominently there, though not featured prominently in the actual movie. In the, nor in the stage play. Nor no, he's not featured in the stage play at all. Right. But in the movie, he's just got that one scene. Unforgettable. It is scene. a cameo. <laughs> oh, it is. It, written by David Mamet specifically for Baldwin. Uh, specifically for the the movie version of Glen Gary, Glen Ross, which we're showing at Gateway Film Center in 35 millimeter. Oh, and when is that? That uh, begins a run on April 1st. Right. Now this is a film for those who love acting of the highest order. Yes. In man. Fact, in fact, in fact, when people weren't on to be filmed, they would come on the set just to watch these guys. Yeah. Because we had Baldwin. Mm-hmm. Al Pacino. Right. Ed Harris. Got it. Jack Lemmon. Oh. Um, I think that's it. No, 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 no. We can't forget uh, Kevin Spacey. Oh, my Kevin right. Kevin Spacey. In, a, in, a very, uh, in one of his earlier roles. And um, Alan Arkin. Yeah, he does. Terrific. Appear, Everybody right. is fabulous oh. in this movie. Um, Only one nomination. Yeah, you know, let's talk about that for a second. So... This is 1992. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Well, there was so what many. What a year! Wow. Yeah. Right. So many great. What movies. one? What one? Schindler's List or Unforgiven? Unforgiven. You got okay. it. Yeah. So, but you, my point is, right around that pocket, the early 90s, you had all these great movies. You had Spielberg knocking them out of the park. You had Clint Eastwood uh, mounts his renaissance with uh, Unforgiven, and uh, Pulp well, Fiction was just a couple of years later. Listen, you, that year, a nomination. Yeah. For uh, a few good men, mm. uh, another the, great stage play the, adaptation. H Howard's End. All right. Uh, Scent of a Woman. Really, was that year? I think so. Interesting. Well, uh, yeah, the uh, best actor in the lead. Is, didn't he win? He did. See, that's amazing to me. <laughs> because and he was also I, nominated for Glenn Gary. This is really. <laughs> uh, what an interesting kind of turning point there for Pacino because I always saw Scent of a Woman as the beginning of his you know late era Pacino yeah. bombastic over the top performances this performance in here is one of his finest achievements he is so great and he for was, him underplays it oh yeah <laughs> he is but you know if you're he's underplaying it but Mamet gives him m music he gives him music, <laughs> and Pacino makes those lines sing, man. And he is, he does, you know, we look back on this movie and, and often refer to it as Alec Baldwin's finest five minutes yeah, in was. movies. Look, if Baldwin but, comes in, he's like, he's like a suit coming in to tell yeah. these poor real estate salesmen that they are nothing but a dung heap. Yeah. And, I mean, the only one who's really performing is Pacino, right? What's that? The only one who's really... Oh, the, sa really, the sales uh, team? The sales team. Yes. Which is... It's cool that you bring that up because uh, that scene, uh, Al Pacino's character, uh, Ricky Roma, <laughs> is not in the room. He's not in the room at the time. <laughs> cool. Which you kind of think about, what would Ricky Roma have done with that character? You know, yeah. those two guys would have eaten each other alive. <laughs> well, they, all of them used to call this death of an effing salesman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically the premise of the movie, for those who haven't seen it, is that there's this uh, team of middle-aged sales, real estate salesmen, and um, they're floundering. 
except for the Pacino character, who right. is doing a good job. But um, they're after better leads. And uh, yeah, boy, and anybody who does sales knows that's where the game yeah. is, right in the lead. And Baldwin carries uh, the key to the Glen Gary leads, so called. And if they could yeah. only get their hands on these leads right. from that title, Glen Gary is one set of houses. Glenn Ross and they just put he Mammoth just puts it together. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. It just sounds yeah, it's great. Like, it's like two of the places where they sell homes. Yeah, so Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. But it's really a, a really rich premise to pit these men against each other, but also to help each other. You know, there's camaraderie, but there's uh, competition, uh, and then there's this the the the, uh, the stench of failure looming over oh, all right. of them. You know, nobody uh, when you consider the cast. I think Jack Lemmon is right up there, almost with Pacino. Oh my God, he's so great! It's when he goes out to sell. Mm -hmm. I think he visits somewhere to some guy who is in no way going to buy right. real estate, and Lemmon needs it so badly. Yeah. It's a beautiful scene. You know, if anybody thinks this Jack Lemmon is just some like it hot, watch him. Well, yeah, this. I mean, clearly he was not just that, you know. But what I think is fascinating about his performance. Is that it does take that that Jack Lemon charm, that sort of almost bubbly, you know, that bubbly, fresh faced character from the sixties and you know, shows him what what that or shows us what that character would be like in this situation. And it's sad. Yeah. You know, it is uh irrepressibly a downer. Yeah, you know, and if you have any ideas of salesmen and stockbrokers in the 80s and 90s this mm -hmm. is the film to see where almost society itself is beginning to turn very strongly against glib sales guys yeah and these are the, the these are the essence of of who they were back in the early days of 60s 70s we all knew they were a stereotype but they were fast talking they were high charged but as you're moved in to the 80s and 90s that world was crumbling and they were mammoth just caught perfectly the crumbling empire yeah, right <laughs> and pacino's character poised so perfectly you know he he's a he's an, an an adapter you know what i mean he's not doing that he's not doing the fast talking stuff he's doing this like weird like he's he's like a predator He's a predator. He preys on uh, Jonathan Price. Remember that? <laughs> and uh, how he works on that guy's psychology is really <laughs> scary. Um, one of my favorite scenes in in all of '90s cinema is uh, Pacino's dressing down of um, Kevin Spacey's character, and that to me is every bit as um, dynamic as Baldwin's um, brutal motivation scene. But him telling Kevin Spacey that he is just a child <laughs> in a world of men um, is really powerful. And Spacey at the at the time was not he was not the star that he is now. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so perfectly suited to play. He's these, an operative in the office, reasons. right? Yeah, he's now. Here's I think from Baldwin's speech, but I I wanted to give people an idea of David Mamet's robust mm -hmm. very masculine sure um expletive ridden speech which comes from his writing on broadway and they come and he also <clears throat> i think wrote and directed but at least directed the untouchables uh mammoth no mammoth wrote, wrote it. it right that's Brian wrote Palmer it. directed De Palmer it. Did it. yeah but here's a here's a line you can't close the leads you're given you can't close s-h-i-t uh -huh. you are s-h-i-t Hit the bricks, pal, and beat it, because you are going out. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> Hit the bricks. Hit the bricks. Boy. So many, and, and again, you know, Baldwin just makes that, uh, makes a symphony of those, those words. Um, this movie was directed by a guy named J James Foley. Yeah. I don't think he ever really went on to, to do much of anything, uh, certainly nothing as significant as this. No, he had confidence. Do you remember that with... I think it was with the... No, there's my point. I don't remember it. Okay, exactly. But Al Pacino was in it, and Dustin Hoffman. Hmm. Isn't that strange? Yeah. And I didn't either. That Probably. perfect stranger with Halle Berry and Bruce Willis. I was just also trying to pick it. out... I mean, it was your, it's your point. 
I don't know James Foley much. I know him for this, yeah. but then I'm looking back and I don't see much. Uh, but but you can look at Mammoth for not only Untouchables but Ronin, and and I I'll bet you one of your favorite films. Yeah. The Verdict. Oh yeah, David Mamet wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's interesting. Yeah. With well, Paul Newman, since for Newman. sure, and that's one of Paul Newman's finest performances. Um, so we're Mamet talking was a, you know, Mamet went on to direct films himself. Uh, he had a a nice little run there, but I can't. Even, he was, you know, primarily a screenwriter and a playwright and a better writer uh, uh, than a director. James yeah. Foley, I do want to say, though, this movie, I remember seeing it, and I remember being mesmerized by it. It does feel a bit stagey, and I think it's deliberate. It also has this really strange... It, it has this uh, strange quality about it. It feels empty. Like, the emptiness of these characters has permeated the frame of the movie. It it puts it casts a weird spell over you. Like, uh, I'm not quite sure how to describe it except to say that it feels sort of like you feel their, you feel their loneliness. Well, you know, it, to pick up on what you're saying, first of all, my love of theater translates to this immediately. This was made for the stage, and mm -hmm. I think you were right. There's something stagey about it. Well, you know, I guess if I was going to put my finger on it, it would be that you don't see a lot of other human beings at all. Yeah. It feels, that their world feels hermetic, that yeah. they are sealed off from the rest of humanity. And don't you think uh, maybe uh, uh, Hateful Eight in that same In the Cabin, you have all these characters, I love it, where film, which is so expansive, mm -hmm. can come down and really make you feel yeah. tight. Uh, and, and the other thing, golly, what's the, the other thing that you said was, um, anyway, well, I think that feeling that you were getting about the emptiness, yeah. for me, was the feeling that here are guys who are facing the ultimate abyss, unemployment. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. and I really felt that hanging over all of it, the desperation for men who aren't used to being desperate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well. Man. man I wow, I'm exhausted. Really brought I, haven't me down. Even, I haven't even seen it, and I'm exhausted again. Uh, <laughs> but I will tell you, for me, it is one of the finest films of an of ensemble acting. Oh, I maybe maybe one of the best. Yeah. And certainly a high watermark of 1990s American cinema. See it in 35mm at the Gateway Film Center.